He is the director of uh, the PhD program, IMAP. Uh, he is associate editor of Vectors, Journal of Culture and Technology, in a dynamic vernacular, um, which challenges the assumptions about the form of published scholarship. Uh, he has received a MacArthur grant for this year for Critical Commons, which is a project I'm sure he's going to talk about. Steve Anderson. Hey, wow. So what I have is kind of a, a, a two different talks, actually. Evocative knowledge objects is one, and the war between theory and pra practice is actually a slightly different riff. And I was, at one point, going to completely integrate them, and then I decided that they actually worked better as two separate objects, partly because of the things that they're trying to address. Um, and so when I say evocative knowledge objects, I actually just kind of mean, in, I think I incline more toward the digital object, you know, sort of like less of the physical objects in the world um, and more of the kinds of... Um, tools and systems and architectures that allow us to think differently about the things that we're doing that we're doing, and thinking about the world. The way that I have kind of ended up framing this to make it make sense to me is by using this kind of simple binary from Foucault. And um, the idea of the episteme and the techne, and these are drawn from ancient Greek philosophy, and they're root words, obviously, for epistemology, the study of knowledge, and techne for um, technology. Um, and it's interesting to me that these two things are historically have been really put at opposite, opposite ends of a spectrum. So when we're thinking and thinking about knowledge and the way we learn and the way we know, we're doing the opposite of what we're doing when we're working with our hands and making things. And this is sort of, uh, you know, partly a legacy of the liberal arts and the kind of bourgeois humanities and the idea that people who are, live in the mind don't need to make things with their hands and that's kind of a lower class pursuit. Really, you know, when it's done right, um, looking at, at epistemes allows you to include technique. Um, so for Foucault, it's really, you know, epistemes are kind of like conditions of the possibility of knowledge. And it, um, that includes everything. So, um, you know, ways of thinking, sort of like practices in science, um, means of exploration, ways of um, going about exploring and knowing things. Um, and all of those things then brush up against things that you actually make or do with your hands. Um, but that, I think that, that that divide still persists. And um, kind of like trying to you know, understand a different model for what research is in the School of Cinematic Arts, for example, has been a, a battle that we've been fighting for years now, um, trying to make the kind of things that we do here in making and designing and programming and creating stuff be understood as a form of research. So I started looking around and thinking, well, what are the tools to think with that I use a lot? And in some cases, it's something that I am happy to be part of trying to design myself. In other cases, I just find things that other people have made that I think are really interesting. Um, the Wordle tool is one of those. It will actually go out, um, pull the feed from that website, whatever it is, um, and give you this dynamically generated um, you know, envisioning of the contents of the site. So we can all sort of pick our favorite visualization tools, and there are lots of them. CNET used to do this nice thing with the articles on the, on the blog that was just you know, allowing you to make connections among, you know, just based on the, the tags um, that were associated with the, um, the posts. Um, and, you know, as much as I kind of love these things, on my bad days, I sort of think like, but isn't this exactly what Ted Nelson was proposing 45 years ago, right? These, you know, kind of simple connections based on, on, on logic or association or, or um, you know, resonance. Um, and why haven't we come farther than this in ways of organizing and accessing and visualizing information? Something more interesting happens when these kinds of tools begin to inflect the ways that we actually think and come up with our ideas and map out our own um, works of scholarship or expression or whatever they are. One of the things um, Peggy blogged recently, the Many Eyes Project, um, and this guy Martin Wattenberg, who's sort of my rock star uh, data visualization guy, has done any number of projects, and the Bewitched um, website has a nice mapping of those. Um, one of them is the um, name voyager, the baby name wizard. And you actually can go in and um, you know type in whatever name you want, and it gives you a visualization of what the popularity of that name was at any given time. So I actually went and typed in my own daughter's name. So you type in Ginger, right? And you find out that, in fact, um, Ginger, it's kind of hard to read, peaked in around 1967. <laughs> so here's this nice tool that, you know, like, I would have never known that, but here it is, 1967, it's proof positive. There's a spike here around the 1930s, and then there's another one here around, you know, kind of mid-60s, speaking around 67, and a precipitous drop-off after that. And so we say, well, why might that be? Um, and yes, in fact, um, Gilgan's Island, 1964-1967, correlates 
perfectly with the um, with the spike in the name Ginger. Um, and so I was thinking, like, so this is where the, the presentation gets weird, right? Because what I realized is what I wanted was a tool for me to kind of like map this thought process. It's like, you know, I'm looking for examples of data visualization online. Oh, let's look at, Mar look at Martin Wattenberg's site. Oh, there's the baby wizard. We actually looked at that before we named Ginger. And you guys have all seen Ginger because she's here on my desktop, right? Um, but what I really want is a way to kind of speak this line of argument and experience through media. And it's really hard to do that, right? Because you know, it's like, oh, I have this, I have this, this tool here, you know, and I could, I could embed the Ginger Grant. <laughs> well, she pretends to be Marilyn Monroe, basically, right? <laughs> So I was thinking, like, well, it'd be good to show that clip in case, like, you know, people didn't grow up on Gilligan's Island the way I did. Um, and maybe, you know, for some people, Tina Louise as Ginger Grant is nothing more than a cheap 1960s knockoff of Marilyn Monroe. You know, and, and I was thinking, like, well, actually, you know, there's a way of thinking about it that's like Marilyn Monroe is just kind of a cheap Ginger Rogers knockoff, exactly. right? Um, and, oh, and there's the other spike from the Martin Wattenberg graph around, you know, in the 1930s was for Ginger Rogers. Um, and, oh, let's see what we get when we go to... Um, when we go to YouTube and, and look for Ginger Rogers numbers. So we get a fan vid, um, kind of cut up medley of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire dancing to the song that's now being sung by Marilyn Monroe. Um, which I, gives me enormous pleasure. What I really want is something that will more or less automate that process. It's like I, I wish I could just kind of speak this in an even more fluid way. And it's like this is this is kind of this is kind of cute. It's got the gestural interface. It lets me embed lots of things and link in and out of of, of, of the network. Um, but really, it's kind of not doing everything that I want it to do. It's just kind of like it's an approximation of the thing that I wish um, were really possible. I first started thinking about this in, in looking back over the eight years or so that I've been involved in the Institute for Multimedia Literacy and this, these efforts to kind of come up with innovative forms of, of pedagogy and learning and um, kind of digital media and technology um, enhanced scholarship, let's say. And it used to be that I would spend all my time kind of unraveling what I regarded as a, a core set of fallacies against popular perception. Um, and the first one was that there's a kind of inverse relationship between <coughs> images and text. That if you use a lot of pictures, your text must be somehow compromised. Um, and interestingly, that's an argument that I don't feel like I have to make so much anymore. I feel like we've kind of almost won that one. The idea that there's an inverse relationship between content and design, I think, has been a little bit more pernicious. Um, and particularly the idea that if you're a designer, you probably don't have much to say for yourself. Um, maybe we can, through collaboration, like the stuff we do with vectors, you can, you know, put other people's ideas into practice. Um, but I think that this is one that, um, you know, programs like IMAP, the kind of work that's coming out of IMD, is really, I think, going a long way towards um, making that that opposition no longer seem as, as kind of viable or taken for granted as it once was. The one that I think we still have the hardest time with is, is technology, because people are still, you know, maybe they're afraid of images, they're probably afraid of design, but they're really afraid of technology kind of out in, out in the world, right? Um, and so the idea that if you're a designer but you're too good at programming, you're probably not a very good designer, um, has, is something that you know I think is also particularly kind of insidious. Well, actually, what we're talking about here is the creation of new scholarly vernaculars. Um, that when you combine really interesting research with you know good technology and, and, and great design, what you end up with is something some genuinely new expressive mode. And it seems to me that the the you know if we are talking about a new the invention of a new scholarly vernacular, it's going to be because of um, uh, transformations like this, technology kind of really transforming research. Um, but the idea that design is informing technology is a little bit, um, is a little bit more, I think, provocative. Um, and the technology need not be something that we regard as just received, um, and that we do the things that our databases will allow us to do, but actually, you know, maybe we should be in on, you know, working with technologists to think about new modes of um, new kinds of databases, new ways of creating relationships within databases. Um, and then ultimately I think the idea that research and design inform each other is kind of the place that we're trying to get, that these things are not broken out into these oppositions but actually are functioning in a more um, kind of integrated and, and synthetic mode, um, which we might call something like multimodal scholarship. Instead of, you know, simply, you know, trying to express ourselves as clearly or as effectively as possible, uh, maybe what we're doing is creating tools to think with or these evocative knowledge objects, things that actually 
uh, or make, making us maybe think differently than just um, kind of getting the idea as clearly as possible. So if we're thinking about knowledge objects and kind of um, epistemes, um, it seems like a really interesting thing has happened with the conjunction, the collision of history and digital technology. And one of the things that we find is that there's this desire, this, this kind of sense of emergent possibility that we can finally create the archive that we've always wanted. But it's equally true that digital technology enables us to create total chaos out of, out of all of these nice orderly histories um, that the archives seem to promise us. Um, so it's always, that's to me, it's always kind of the, the, the flip side of the digital, the digital archive that's, that's totalizing um, and, and holds everything and stores everything is also the possibility that we can go in and mine it in all of these um, digressive or, or contradictory ways. The project that Veronica mentioned at the outset um, for which we got uh, one of the MacArthur Digital Media and Learning Grants is this thing called Critical Commons. It's a, a site um, that is meant to be a kind of advocacy site for fair use, especially in academic context, but also in other um, in other categories of fair use as well. It started off by teaching and wanting to always have all my media with me at all times so that whatever digressions came up, whatever student feedback, whatever directions things take took, um, I would want to have a hard drive with everything on it. The reason that it, it makes the claim that it's a fair use space is that you never get access to media without commentary. So um, basically every time you upload a clip, if you try to upload a clip, you have to put stuff in there about why it's important. Um, if you are in the site, you can, you can it pretty much, it's open, publicly can be viewed, always in that kind of critical context, um, but to download clips at this point, um, we're going with registered users that are the only ones that can do that. And we'll see how, um, when we get re legal, real legal representation, whether that continues to be necessary.